Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to today's session of Urban Manifesto. This is a big moment for humanity as we face one of the biggest challenges of our lifetime. <laughs> the most important question to ask as we think about our collective future is how to build a fairer, healthier, and greener future. This pandemic has obviously exposed the deep fractures in our society. The normal that made up our life before COVID was not really working. Uh, when we do move towards the road to recovery, let's ignore the instincts to go back to the way things were. In the Urban Manifesto series, we outline the urban agenda for a brave new world where we hope uh, we'll be more inclusive, we'll be more green and more livable. This series um, hopes to outline some of those ideas. And uh, we bring this to you in partnership with Architecture Foundation and we are part of the ongoing 100 Day Studio and we are honored to welcome that community as well. I'm Pratima Manohar uh, from the Urban Vision from India and I'm thrilled to bring this discussion with you to you with my colleague Lucy Villavant. Lucy? Welcome everybody to another Urban Manifesto webinar. We are delighted to be focusing on the very important theme of the future of placemaking. Um, we are absolutely delighted that, that today our two speakers are two um, real proactive, um, exceptional uh, experts, leaders in their field. Um, welcome to Ethan Kent, the co-founder of Placemaking X, based in New York City. And equally welcome to PK Das, who is a, a renowned uh, architect activist and founder of PK Das Architects. Uh, based in Mumbai. Now, place. Place is a highly resonant uh, word uh, with many, 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 uh, many elements to its significant. The interrelated sig significance of all the different aspects of it are too, uh, too many to discuss here. There are so many books that go into this. Um, but um, these are all of human value um, of on both a tangible and an intangible uh, dimension or level, amongst them being uh, livability, facility, connectivity, adaptability, accessibility, inclusivity, uh, locality, um, memories, narrative, and soul. Now, um, there are, it is undeniable that there remain very, very many serious blocks to the systemic changes that are needed in every society across the world to realize more places um, that would embody these qualities and capacities. So with Urban Manifesto as part of our mandate, and you will notice if you've been following us every single week, um, and we commit to doing this uh, at regular intervals in the, in the future every Tuesday, we're continuing to focus as a part of what we do on the fast track tactical urbanist side of placemaking. Um, the strategies that have really been come to the fore, um, in many cases due to the, the almighty efforts of local municipalities and third sector organizations and retailers now, as things in some parts of the world start to open up a little bit. Um, during this pandemic, so for example, to improve um, the streets for uh, cyclists and for pedestrians to improve safety, and also to safe, to strengthen community support networks. Now, these um, measures, they really ad demonstrate that adaptations to place can be done well, and they can be done at speed. It also begs the question of um, what other aspects of placemaking can be accelerated in, in, at this time and in, and in the future as we transition into a new era. So we're looking at the centrality of placemaking as a, a vital multidisciplinary practice. Um, and a key element of that that we want to tease out a little bit as a question during this webinar is how citizens and stakeholders can further be empowered uh, to collaborate and a key part of that is also how they can themselves become prime movers. 
and thereby uh, engender a greater sense of a new and a fresh sense of uh, agency in terms of placemaking. So before we, um, we turn to Ethan and PK to present their respective personal manifestos, um, we must ask, as we do every week, our speakers, um, how have you been managing under lockdown? Ethan? Uh, so I'll go ahead, sure. Th yeah. Um, first of all, I want to say it's, it's really good to be with all you all uh, and uh, you know, people I've learned from, been inspired from, you know, and been, been friends with for a long time. Um, and uh, this is, you know, help, these types of conversations have definitely helped through lockdown. Um, I have, you know, it's, it's it, obviously in New York, it's it's been a challenge. Um, and, uh, but, you know, also, also a, a beautiful time in ways to, 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 to step back and realize what's important to us and how many things still do work in, in this ch challenging time. Mm. Uh, I've also been lucky to, to get out of the city right now at, at my mother's house here in Rhode Island and um, uh, feeling very lucky, but, but all the, but been trying to connect with friends all around the world and that are all learning together and, uh, and thinking deeper, thinking bigger about what we need to do, what we can do. Mm. Uh, so mm. looking forward to this conversation. Thank you. Great. Fantastic. How about you, K PK? Well, I would say I'm not doing very well, actually, because... That's I, okay. I, oh, that's, yeah, uh, because, I'm sorry you know, one, yeah, one of the big losses probably is not being able to meet people. Mm. That's where we draw our energies and ideas mm. from. Mm. Meeting people, talking to them and sharing and, you know, mm. um, talking about common interests and about our cities. And that's well, just happening through talks like this through Zoom and other medium, but, you know, being across each other, looking at each other's face, feeling one another's pain and joy and sorrows, that's missing, you know. So that's that's sort of not giving us enough, giving me enough energy mm -hmm. and strength and the power to think critically. That's my loss. That's why I'm not doing too well. Mm. I totally relate to that. Uh, there's nothing like human contact in a one-to-one -one physical sense. <laughs> we, um, yeah, technology has really served us pretty well so far, and uh, we don't know how much longer we're going on for. But here in the in the here and now, let's um, turn to your personal manifestos. Um, so, who's going to go first? Toss a coin. Well, Ethan. Ethan, go ahead. Very, very nice. Sweet. Wait, that, those are my slides. <laughs> you have to go first, PK, now. You to... <laughs> okay, that's not my first slide. Um, okay. Well, one, one of the, um, can you go to the first slide, uh, Prathima, uh, which is the map? Uh, the, uh, yeah, that's right. Well, one of the, um, just three things, as I've been told to cite as being most important. Uh, but uh, let me clarify, these are not my personal manifestos. Uh, or objectives. Uh, these are our collective uh, interests through mm -hmm. various movements of citizens and people in, in the city of Mumbai and elsewhere in the world. Uh, the very first thing that I'm really deeply concerned about is our environment and the whole idea of being able to build with nature. I think that has to be the predominant theme uh, mm -hmm. upon which we must uh, you know, form our work and ideas and actions. Uh, in the, it's, it's very, very important, critical at this stage of the kind of climate change effect, uh, effects that we are now kind of experiencing. Uh, and, you know, the climate change effects are pandemic. Uh, it's endemic, it's pandemic, whatever you call it. Mm. And it's killing over 300 to 400,000 people every mm. year around the world. Mm. So, you know, it, in many ways, it's a much bigger pandemic than the uh, COVID-19. So that's really uh, the central uh, objective of my uh, thinking uh, mm. and work. The second, which is to me really uh, very, very important, is building relationships. Uh, relationships between people and collectively with nature. And both of which have diminished over the years. Uh, people no more engaging dialogue with each other. Democratic space has been shrinking as we've been going by and expanding our cities. 
uh, and undertaking major development works. And we need to get back to building these relationships. But what's very important is to collectively build our relationship with nature, with natural areas and natural elements, for they would have to form the idea of our development plans. In fact, the development plans would have to be based on the ideas of conservation, reinvigoration, and expansion of natural areas and elements. The third, uh, maybe the second slide you could show in that, is um, <clears throat> you know the whole question of this is a poster for public campaign in a neighborhood of Mumbai, which really means that you uh, bring about a, you know there's a. Juhu Giri Pyarse means actually it's a coercive action uh, that you need to sort of take collectively to bring about change, but with a bit of love. I mean, that's the translation of Hindi to English. But this is a neighborhood map and it shows how we are proposing to network and connect various natural areas of the place. And what's significant about networking public spaces is the networking of people. And it, that's the central idea. So people and spaces and nature, they really form the three aspects that are significantly, uh, that must significantly influence the idea of public spaces and the making of public spaces. The next slide, if you can um, just go to, is the idea of a public campaign, running public campaigns, which I talked about through the poster, but much more through, through newspapers, through radio, through television, uh, large public campaigns, to build public knowledge and to be able to exchange and disseminate knowledge about, about nature, in which one of the first things that I really missed out in the, uh, in the first slide was really the process of mapping. And we cannot anymore rely upon data which is being, uh, thrown, which is being thrown at us time and again by our governments. At least in India, we've never relied on this. They're most often bluffed. We need to have people's data. And mapping is a social and political process and democratization of data. So really, that's the, the second thing that I'm talking about. And the third really is to connect all of that, the mapping process, building with nature, building relationships into finally re being able to re-envision our cities. We need to go through this massive exercise and dialogue of re-envisioning our cities through public spaces movements of projects that are scalable to cities, to city levels, of about integration of cities, which are otherwise being broken down into disparate fragments through a number of ways, whether it's the caste differences or the religious religion differences or the faith or whatever you say, or the gender differences and so on and so forth. We are being broken down gradually into our disparate fragments, but we need to put them together. We need to piece the cities together and this integration and scalability through projects is really, in a sense, a way forward. So to conclude my three points, I would sort of say what I've learned through my experiences here in the city of the past 40 years is really to intervene, to be able to intervene in the ongoing processes of exclusivity, of exclusive developments, or rather exclusion of more and more people as we go by through our programs of development movements for expansion of public spaces. So I'm not just talking about conservation, restoration, but I'm also talking about expansion of public spaces. For public spaces are sharply declining and shrinking over time. And therefore, we need these movements for expansion of public spaces, to me, is an incredible democratic means for the achievement of sustainable social and environmental change. Indeed, cities that are sustainable. Thank you. I just missed out two quick slides to talk about this change. Uh, could you just, Prathima, run through those three slides very quickly? Uh, in short, to say that we bring the next three slides, that really what demonstrates what, no, no, just move forward, please, to the last three slides, yeah. Just after this, maybe. Yes, so these are three projects in Mumbai, in three different neighborhoods. You can move to the second and the third. And essentially, the point I'm making through here is that through intervention and through collective neighborhood intervention, we demonstrate social and environmental change. Pratima, the next slide, please. 
And these places have indeed changed significantly. So not only people have come together, but they engage in the management of these spaces, they define urban space, they manage these urban areas, and compel our governments and municipal corporations to function in a certain way that is participatory. Yeah, the third slide. I think that's all about it. Thank you. I think I've exceeded my time of three minutes. Bravo, bravo. That's magnificent manifesto. It covers the macro to the micro with um, holistic and non-piecemeal non -piecemeal strategies. Wonderful. Uh, thank you very much. Um, how about, so now Ethan, Ethan's personal manifesto. Uh, wow. Okay. Well, thank you, guys. This is um, this is fun to, to get to be a part of. Uh, partly because really my my new role is again learning from and highlighting the role of people like you all um, with Placemaking X. And so our you know our manifesto is uh, to to create a movement of placemaking leaders that are really turning upside down the shaping of cities to start with people and, and public spaces to start with the messages that. That PK just brought to you, and the, the the work, the you know, the body of work that he's developed, and um, but connecting people all over the world that are that are doing this similar work, um, and uh, you know, for, so but first of all, though, you know, to, to mention you all because you, um, you know, Pratima is someone I've known for for many many years, and uh, has, you know, visited us in New York many times. I've gotten to be a part of a conference in in, in Mumbai, you know, that she organized. Um, and uh, she's had many wonderful study tours uh, in New York and other parts of the world that are connecting leaders in New York. I've been connected to people in New York through her and uh, uh, and, and elsewhere. Um, and so it's this networked learning that you all embody and, and really lead on better than anybody uh, that I think is the, the type of um, leadership and, and change that, that needs to occur. And we're, we're designing Placemaking Exxon. And Lucy's case, your, your book, Recoded City, um, you know, and participatory placemaking highlighted, you know, amazing models and organizations for placemaking around the world that we need to keep learning from. Uh, the, the problem is that everyone's doing this alone often. We're, we're learning, in, uh, you know, in isolation. Um, and now is the challenge. And, and through these new technologies and these efforts to, to, to gather online in these ways, we can accelerate um, the, the the learning, the networking, the the collective action and, and messaging um, that your book Recorded City really helped get started, and we need to we need to continue to build on that. Um, and of course, with PK, we've actually done a lot of this together. Uh, you, you, that slide you're showing of, of all the different conferences, PK has been to I think more to more than anyone, uh, more than any of those than um, than 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 that we you know. Uh, so we're we're trying to build now networks, regional networks. Um, we have about 14 regional placemaking networks that have emerged out of some of these conferences. One of the more recent ones is, is Placemaking India that Pratima has really helped lead and PK has been part of. There was a there was a placemaking uh, weekend in Pune in uh, 2019 and, there, and Pratima has been helping to plan, um, hopefully, uh, a, a conference in this December in um, in, in your community, uh, well, if, if this happens, but maybe we can do it virtually if it doesn't happen physically. Um, uh, but um, but sort of the the larger mission of Placemaking X is really to be you know to be a network of the leaders uh, accelerating placemaking globally uh, and realizing that every part of the world is has strengths in some ways weaknesses in others uh, and we see place as this convergence force as this as this means through which we can bring together the best of many different disciplines sectors um, advocates um, it creates a little humility that we all. We all a lot, but we have our, the learning curve is steep. Um, but also, the best way to create the systemic change necessary is to use the, the, the disruptive power of place to ground us in in uh, in our communities and common sense in the debates that inevitably occur around public space. Um, and certainly, you know, we, we're all familiar with many of the, the really strong debates around technology right now. And India has been a big part of the. You know, embracing smart cities in positive ways, but obviously also in the siloed uh, sort of top-down solution-oriented approach that, that limits it. And uh, we think a lot of these technologies need to be applied faster, uh, mm. and, but, uh, but we, if we're applying them in a way that, that's just place-sensitive, not place-led, we're limiting the impact and limiting the potential application of them. Um, yeah. you know, or other you know, 
areas, uh, you know, equity, obviously, inclusion are, are now, you know, right, rightfully and, you know, uh, front and center in many people's minds. Uh, we need to leverage places of, and the debates around public space to really go deeper around the, the histories, the, the structural racism that they have come out of and they are perpetuating in many ways. Um, place and place making can be used to change these. It can also be used to perpetuate them, unfortunately, um, if we don't ask deep enough questions uh, for uh, and, and really uncover the, the histories of, of, of oppression and, and pain that, that, that are embodied in many ways in, in the public realm. Uh, so how so how public space can uh, and place making at every scale, whether in front of our homes, you know, citywide, globally, na nationally, uh, we need to make sure we're we're not just perpetuating existing systems, but looking for systemic change, um, looking for new models of place-led governance, financing, participation, design. Uh, all the disciplines need to be challenged to go further. There, there, the the progressive wings of most disciplines are. What we call place sensitive at best. They're they're saying we got. They're telling the communities we got this. We we understand na natural issues and historic cultural equity issues, and they're designing in response to them. That's not enough. To really utilize the skills of these disciplines and their their ideas, we need to empower, challenge communities to lead, and to, to the role of the expert in service of of communities. Uh, we need to amplify the, the models that are doing this. I think that's the, the way these ideas are going to go viral. Um, and it's, you know, in so public space is uh, not just about set of design solutions. It's, it's, a, it's really the, it's the human outcomes. It's the social outcomes that, that, that PK was saying, you know, we, we miss um, that it really makes these ideas go viral. The joy that, that public space can bring is what ultimately will help out, help communities outcompete uh, you know, fractured places, places that are, are being, you know, where the dominant model is to extract shared value from the public realm, which unfortunately is the is the in most globalized development uh, patterns and cultures. Uh, it's a very, still a very extractive model of development from the extraction from the street, from the consumer, very consumeristic. Um, we need to show the places that where there's the most joy, the most happiness, the most equality. Those are the places that create the most shared value and the most and, and create private value and private wealth. Um, and so lastly, we need to accelerate impact. We can't just have a bunch of one off great successes and leaders, um, but we need to empower, facilitate, connect people doing this all over the world. Uh, everyone needs to be a placemaking leader, uh, a, a facilitator, a connector. Uh, it, we you know we can't just stay within our, our disciplines our silos our our, our top down government models um, you know we need to leverage all those all those you know great institutions and uh, and build from them um, but ultimately we need more power and capacity at the community scale at the place scale uh, to be partners in driving change uh, in learning um, and action so that's that's our goal we invite everyone to be you know part of placemaking X to to help figure this out with us. Uh, we need to, to reach out to new partners, new disciplines, new, uh, and that's what Placemaking India is doing, and, and, and many other regional networks around the world are, are leading this conversation. So, so looking forward to you know, discussing with you how we can best uh, best work together to address this, to you know, move this agenda forward. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you for encapsulating all the related themes of Placemaking X in such a short time. Um, yeah, I totally agree with you. This point of, um, and this is something that we spent some time focusing on and uh, with our Recoded City book, which of course was um, was also, you know, equally based on a lot of live research that uh, myself and the co my co-author Thomas Omicora did, but also an awful lot of um, practical placemaking projects that Thomas did in the uh, preceding years. Um, you know, one thing we, we spent some time engaging our brains on was this whole relationship of, you know, some things have to grow out of the local. In fact, the, the majority of things in good placemaking have to emerge and uh, be nurtured from local conditions. So they have to be placemaking <laughs> solutions that are bespoke or tailored to particular con very specific conditions. But at the same time, placemaking has many, many universals. There are universal uh, qualities and capacities that you can, uh, you can, you can uh, draw together as a mass of ideas and strategies. 
um, and, uh, and not getting confused about the difference between the two, I think, is really important. Um, so thank you very much for that. Um, we will now move on to our uh, a friendly interrogation. <laughs> uh, Pratima yeah. and I will take it in turns to uh, to uh, give you some very well um, well considered, hopefully well considered questions. So we we understand uh, where you're each coming from a little bit better, and our audience can then consider some questions for themselves a little bit a little bit further along. So over to you, Prathima. Yeah, thank you, PK and Ethan, for laying out that um, agenda. Uh, you know, in such a brief time, I think it's um, the agenda of placemaking is so crucial because the agenda of cities is so crucial, right? Like, I think um, uh, one of the professors at Howard Kennedy School once said that the greatest challenge of our times is to build better cities and uh, a focus on place and place making um, has been able to successfully catalyze better urbanism uh, over the last couple of decades for example uh, i think while uh, master plans and development plans uh, can take you know take, can take ages and uh, uh, in our case in Mumbai, we're still trying to figure out what the next development plan is because uh, it takes a ton of time to develop those policies. Placemaking actually offers a real, immediate, tangible change. And uh, public realm can be such a great way to transform our city. So, you know, my first question to both of you, and uh, PK, we can start with you, is. Um, within the practice of placemaking can we highlight achievements that you know have delivered more sustainable equitable uh, uh, place where you know the tools and the frameworks of uh, placemaking has delivered that change that we all desperately seek to achieve at this point in time and i know in mumbai you can show you know you can share your examples of placemaking uh, as well. Yeah, most certainly. I think uh, uh, examples are very, very important. Uh, examples of uh, change brought about through collective endeavor, uh, through participatory mechanisms, through uh, larger ideas of cities uh, and the change that we want to bring about, um, bringing people together are certainly uh, extremely important to be highlighted and um, and and shared for um you know they, they speak a lot the change that you bring about on the ground is forever can be you know dissected and discussed and you will find new meanings and new ways forever from them uh, as you go forward uh, you know one of the things that i uh, i sort of think is that when we are working on placemaking projects, uh, these are not, in an architectural sense, a design project <clears throat> or designed project uh, to its last detail. Because if you package it completely as a product with the last detail, it leaves no space and opportunity for people to, to engage and change further of, of a process that has begun. So that's that's a kind of a irony that many physical planners, architects, and designers uh, do confront and do engage in. I mean, we kind of try to design places, but I think it's the processes, uh, the process which is which opens up doors and windows for engagement and cross section of ideas that forever engages to change and evolve those details. Uh, that are often can be even demolished and rebuilt, uh, can be rejected and re accepted. Uh, I think that we need to understand that process. And in that process, I think what's very significant is to be able to launch a democratic platform uh, of engagement uh, in which not any individual leader is a hero or an icon. Uh, I mean, sorry to say that it's in bit, I've kind of over the years really been shy about talking about individuals as being champions and heroes. I think we must talk about organizations as icons and heroes and not individuals. I think we need to make a point about that 
because what that does is then it brings in many more people to engage, not shy away, uh, be able to open up in these discussions. And I tell you, people, even the most people whom we think as being the most ordinary or not knowledgeable or formally educated have great ideas to contribute in the making of this collective uh, endeavor towards bringing about change. So yeah, you're right, Pratima, that uh, I think one of our big um, successes in Mumbai truly has been maybe 35, 40 years back when we intervened in a particular space along a coastline in Mumbai and forcibly brought about physical change through uh, local area and neighborhood people. And I think that sent huge signals across the city that sparked off many local and neighborhood movements. And I think that's the measure of success. It's really not the design of how the detailing of the stone and the paving and the landscaping and the lighting, which we often overdo, <laughs> but that's, it's important to be designed well, but surely that's not the end of it all. So what yeah, we I demonstrate is these processes of collectivization and not of individualization. Yeah, I think one of Mumbai's most uh, favorite uh, public realms has been delivered through that, uh, you know, with the community, especially the lo local residents. And you're right, I think we need to highlight that role of institutions and communities as the key kind of player in delivering better uh, cities. But I'll just leave, if you don't mind, with two questions here, not get into the detail of it from what you're saying. I've always begun to question when we keep saying community and people, who, which community, which people? Because often people engage in exclusive uh, communities. Uh, they sort of exclude many other people. There's always this exclusivity process. So we have to be extremely careful how we democratize and make it inclusive. Again, local can be very dangerous at, very often. But being able to make that local and related to the city and to the global becomes again very critical. Otherwise, movements can die by its own, uh, you know, its own limitations of thinking and selfishness. Uh, we have to relate. We have to scale up those ideas and be able to relate uh, to global questions. For example, the climate change issue. I think. I mean, sort of just leaving these two questions for further discussion of the criticality of understanding of local and community. Ethan, uh, would you like to take that on? Have the you've been an evangelist and supporter of placemakers all over the world in a way. You incubated the global placemaking movement. So, if we were to outline the achievements of this movement uh, to deliver more equitable, inclusive, uh, sustain sustainable uh, urban living. Can we showcase some of them? What, uh, would you be able to highlight some examples? Um, sure. Yeah, that's a challenging, fun question. Um, so I mean, in, in many ways, obviously, we have you know the impact has been has been small. It's been challenged. We, you know, we we haven't had enough impact, um, and that's why we're 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 sort of designing place making next to figure out a, a model for broader impact. Um, you know the learning though has been incredible. I mean, one thing I think we've done really well is we've found amazing people and stories around the world of people doing this work. And um, and 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 you and as you said, there's a lot of common principles, common learning between them, and sort of figuring out these shared principles. One of you know the first of which really is that the community is the expert, and we need to support them, respect them in their expertise, draw it out further, build their capacity um, more. And certainly that you know the individual stories um, that I've been lucky to get to know, get to be involved with a little bit, you know, um, you know the, 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 that's the the overwhelming. Um, you know, examples, you know, the, the, like, just like PK says, they're more of a platform for spaces. It's more about the process. It's more about the, uh, how people are allowed to shape and create ownership um, over these spaces uh, and, and the management and ongoing programming and reinvention of these spaces. Um, and certainly, um, you know, as, as Lucy pointed out, you know, if any one user group dominates it, it's a, you know, it's a, 
it's, it can be problematic. It can be a form of privatization um, of control. And that's, it's a constant discussion around that. Um, so how, uh, uh, you know, you know how how we're always it's it's an ongoing question of always learning questioning challenging you know no, no project is finished no project is is perfect um and of course we're you know we're, we need to go deeper now is, is a lot of the, the the you know the global conversation on, on equity and inclusion um is 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 is, is finally you know uncovering in a, in a deeper way um so you know the 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 um the learning um, you know, needs to be grounded in these these case studies. We need to keep sharing the, the most exciting case studies around the world. You know, PKs you know are, are are up there. You know, I'm familiar with a lot of ones in New York that you, you know you've brought the developers from from Maharashtra State um, to uh, to New York to see Bryant Park and Rockefeller Center and uh, you know some of the public plazas like Times Square. Some of the think projects I've gotten to be involved with in, in New York City. Um, and you know, of course, there's there's good pushback on on how they all need to be better and more respectful of, of a whole range of different factors and populations, um, as well. So, uh, you know, let's 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 network the conversation and the learning and and uh, and and and, uh, and you know realize and create more humility um, amongst all the leaders. But we do need you know we do need leaders to be sort of network hubs like 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 you all are to 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 connect and. And grow and build this conversation. Make sure it respects the past, the learning, the the, the elders, um, uh, and uh, but opens up to to, to bigger questions and, and new energy, new learning, uh, as well. Yeah, I think I love those two kind of common themes that you both had. One is uh, PK talking about how institutions and. Uh, um, community networks are the hero and you you've always had that uh, theme of community being the expert and i think that's um that's a crucial kind of approach to thinking about building better urban commons lucy yes yeah, so i this is so far fascinating i've got a question concerning um how community groups can make further headway in contexts where the local municipalities um, are um, perhaps uh, just uh, not not open to uh, the kind of localist change that you know it's they're having challenges seeing um, from the with the same eyes I mean I'm working on a placemaking project with one of my collaborators the Norwegian architect Alex Farunas in in Norway in a in a, a outer area of Oslo and um, we are with a, a group of architects and artists facilitating the retrofitting of a community of an old kindergarten, a disused kindergarten into a community ha house, as they call it, community center, a small one. Um, and the municipality has got so fired up um, for many, many years. They were thinking of doing something more, but uh, just through the bringing together of new people, new community um, members taking more action. Um, we really have found a way to unblock, uh, let's say, sort of an impasse that had at times stopped the creation of community facilities in areas, in a, in a neighborhood which was, a, you know, monoculture, a neighborhood of, of residences. The, um, so, what advice do, do you would you give to community groups who are finding that they, you know, all the blocks I just I mentioned at the outset, are impeding any progress? Are, are there more lateral ways of thinking about um, uh, place making projects? Thank you. I, I can I can start on that. Um, certainly, yeah, a lot of. You know, I think placemaking has has started from different sectors in different parts of the world, um, hmm. and you know, in in the U.S., it has been started more from the community perspective, perhaps um, more philanthropic involvement, more grassroots engagement, more um, leadership from uh, main street organizations or business improvement districts. Um, you know, where I, I think of it in the U.K. and you know, perhaps Norway as well, it's, it's been more. You know, there's a lot of innovation and, and you know, great research and, um, and models more from the disciplines or from government. Um, or, you know, that's, that's a broad generalization, perhaps. But um, uh, and so, you know, we, we have learned a lot about what you know what community-driven placemaking needs to 
look like and how, you know, when there isn't leadership from other sectors, how, how the community can can lead. Um, and it often does start with, you know, the short term, low cost experiments that, that we, you know, we call lighter, quicker, cheaper um, efforts, and they can be sanctioned or, or not. Uh, uh, they, it's the testing, the building momentum, the realizing, you know, the, the realization of the expertise and skills and uh, within a community, the, you know, and again, the process is, is most important of how people get there, the, the learning and debate that occurs from making mistakes from from um, having some conflict around around public spaces, um, but obviously right now uh, we're in this you know era that where we've we've sort of receded inside of our homes and in many cases and and uh, reflected on what's important to us in our communities and in our public realm. Uh, but we've you know we're also now rethinking how do we how, do, how are we going to reinvent our relationship to our communities to our public spaces um, at a very local level and. Uh, um, you know, we and I think we've also rediscovered what's most important to us, um, and how you know our communities, our our our, our homes, our their culture and identity of the public realm, uh, and how do we reconnect with that? How do we recreate it? How do we challenge it? Uh, and you know the ways that um, you know the the economic necessity that's occurring to support uh, retail, street vendors, um, you know other public uses, health recreation in the public realm is is you know unleashing this time to to rethink you know how can we maximize use of space how do we you know who gets to use it who's um you know are we letting restaurants use it too much or you know in some cases we're not thinking about street vendors enough and right. and how they can activate uh um public space to make it safe and and, and sustain their livelihoods um as well so uh this is a time to, to come together and engage in really dynamic, hard public space place making processes for our public, you know, and uh, uh, and you know we're never going to have this opportunity again for, for quite a long time. Uh, and you know, as you said, this traffic's already coming back to the streets. Uh, we need to make sure you know if we're going to address our biggest challenges: of climate change, of equity, of health. Um, you know, we need to drastically repurpose, reinvent how our, our shared spaces, our streets in particular, are. Are used and it really is communities. It's at the local level that that's happening. Uh, it's it's like government playing a role in allowing it to happen in some cases, but it's be, it's it's succeeding and it's it's being allowed to go further because of the success of of communities, of businesses, of actions on the street. Thank you, one hundred percent. How about you, PK? Well, there, there are too many questions uh, involved. Uh, uh, in one question and um, well it really is um, just yeah. basically the advice advice for community groups experiencing yeah, well, setbacks and uh, and obstacles in their way yeah sure i mean you know very clearly local is the whole idea of local or local mm. is a bundle of conflicts and contradictions uh, as we unbundle them uh, and and i think that's where the inquiry lies uh, or the, the the investigation really is uh, is to understand the local because local is not just one cohesive group of people there are people with varying interests and big diversity and conflicting interests right and they you know there are rich to the poor to people who are highly uh, gender biased people to of different age groups with different political leanings and so on and so forth. So it's a, and that's why I keep saying it's a, it's a bundle of uh, conflicts and contradictions. And we need to uh, still sort of swim through those uh, conditions. And placemaking therefore very often, uh, very often uh, dominated by the middle class or the upper class people in many instances, in many, many instances can reduce to exercises in beautification of places. And it sort of in many ways uh, does not then question the need for structural change or contradictions that would inevitably demand uh, significant structural changes. Uh, so the, I'm sort of citing certain uh, you know, issues and limitations and questions uh, which would help us to then sort of uh, make bigger headway. Uh, and, and therefore, um, you know, we experience uh, that as cities are expanding, uh, we have been 
sort of producing more and more backyards of filth, of exclusion, of neglect, of abuse, both of people and places. And so the real challenge has been to try and get into those fringes, those peripheries of cities, those areas of exclusion and abuse uh, to bring about change and to have placemaking as an effort in those areas, in those peripheries uh, of exclusion and the backyards of cities and neighborhoods uh, where we can build community networks. That's truly challenging to me. And there has been very little effort in, towards that, uh, uh, that challenge. Um, I have made many attempts, have not succeeded. Uh, or I've succeeded one out of 100. Uh, and that remains one of the biggest challenges for me in my uh, engagement with public spaces. Uh, and finally, I think dealing with municipal corporations and local governments uh, would really truly be possible if we can bring about a unification or a network of these diverse situations and communities. Uh, for therein lies the strength uh, to influence decisions that affect our lives, to influence governments and municipal corporations in decisions, in decisions that they take that affects our lives. And, and so that's on one hand. On the other hand, Prathima's question of how do you influence municipal corporation or you engage with them. Uh, my second answer to that would be uh, that we need to constantly uh, demonstrate and illustrate how each of these local efforts uh, can actually uh, scale up uh, at the level of the city uh, to bring to, to, to sort of impact in a much bigger way uh, to, to what I call is the re-envisioning of cities. Uh, for example, if I'm talking about a drain uh, or a filthy drainage, open uh, drainage channel in, in a neighborhood of Mumbai, what we call are the Nallas, very famously in India, uh, then can the interventions in the reinvigoration of these of the waters and the environments of the Nallas uh, relate to the network of water, water courses and natural streams and water bodies in the entire city. Uh, so just an example. Uh, and how, therefore, again, going back to my first point that I made, is how to integrate nature and development demands and needs, and how placemaking could really be an effective means to bring about that, uh, that, that, uh, that merger or that integration of mm -hmm. questions of environment with the challenges of development. Uh, and and I, I firmly say that the challenge is not really to try and see who wins and how we can overcome the forces of nature, but how we can give space for nature to expand and, and for the waters to swell and the forests to expand and the pollutions to shrink uh, in the process of development. So it's really the development plans of cities to be re, uh, uh, must 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 be re-envisioned in completely uh, uh, radically different ways, uh, where we're not talking about projects, mm. but we're talking about uh, uh, environmental change, where we're talking about uh, mm. uh, sustainable development mm. and a more resilient structure of uh, of. Uh, community networks. Uh, I think these are some of the big things through which we must not only uh, work with the municipal corporations, but mm. influence them. Mm. Mm. These paradigm shifts that are critical mm. to our very survival and saving of lives, which I said in the beginning, uh, mm. are being lost in these huge numbers through the climate change pandemic. I hear you. I hear you. I, I mean, and also um, Placemaking India made a, a nice comment a little earlier on. The top takeaway from PK Das, let's build organizations, not individuals as icons. 
And, uh, you know, that would imply also that um, we use, uh, we approach biodiversity as allies as well. So natural organizations, biodiversity are allies in placemaking, applying a more lateral approach to um, placemaking issues uh, compared with, you know, the business as usual type of placemaking of the past. So um, I think, thank you very much for that. Pr Prathama has got another question. I, I agree. I think, uh, you know, democracy sometimes becomes about who can scream the loudest and that can mm -hmm. sometimes lead to exclusion, like, um, you know, PK said. And, um, you know, if we really have, you know, for our democracies to truly thrive, we need to ensure that the weakest in our societies thrive. And uh, the great mayor of uh, a South American city uh, once said that the sidewalk and public realm is a symbol of democracy. And I think, uh, you know, the state of our, you know, democracy uh, around the world is reflected uh, by that. And uh, one of the big inspirations for the placemaking movement has been Jane Jacobs. And she once famously said that cities have the cap capability uh, for providing something for everybody only because and only when they're created by everybody. And I think the point that you make, PK, which is how do we get everybody's inputs, uh, the most weakest, uh, during the placemaking uh, yeah. you know, campaign is, pro is probably one of the toughest challenge that all of us around the world face. Mm -hmm. um, and if we as a community aim to create more inclusion and equity, um, you know, how do we achieve it? And how do you amplify frameworks to enable more equity as we create these uh, places, what are the, you know, how, how if we if we can kind of highlight components that have worked to bring a wider group uh, into the frame, um, to bring marginalized, weaker segments of the society to participate, um, you know, are there ways to do that, and how can we embrace those ideas and amplify them? Hey, can I? Take on that question first. Sorry, it's in. Okay, no, go for it, please. Grabbing this opportunity. Pratima has been brilliant because I just missed out a point and she's now brought it up. Uh, well, <laughs> the answer to that, Pratima, would be, my answer to that would be that, uh, you know, it's, it's very, very, very important for peacemaking movements to relate to and network and engage with other democratic rights struggles in the city and world over. Uh, for placemaking movements cannot survive on their own. They have to relate to other democratic rights struggles. Right. And it is this building up of larger networks of struggles of people and movements uh, for democracy, for democratization of cities, its assets and property uh, is really significant. And probably that's the answer to your question, that how do we do it, is to expand our network, uh, not just amongst placemaking organizations across borders, but across multi-sectoral movements. I think this association has to be expanded, and they would enrich each other, uh, both politically and socially, and of course, environmentally. But I think the political lessons are most significant when such movements do network with each other and can and can expand through that process and that's really difficult that's not easy because we speak different languages mind you that's yet another fragmentation that is being systematically uh, been promoted is that each specialist uh, speaks in a different language which is alien to the to another community or to another movement as architect, I would use jargons and languages and thought processes, which nobody else in the communities will understand. And for me to be able to learn that language that communities can understand and participate and contribute actively uh, truly is a challenge to me, not a challenge to the community uh, or to the people in the community or the diversity of people 
and their thoughts and thinking in the community. So it's really about you in, in, at a certain level of how we can liberate ourselves from those exclusive areas and partitions and walls that we built forever uh, through so many different ways, uh, uh, including through our education and exclusive training and sk skill sets that we often be proud about. But how can we break those barriers and debarricade our cities? That really is a challenge to me. And that's my answer to your question, Pratima. Yeah, thank you. And, and inspiring, VK, to hear these perspectives. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, we think that place placemaking need to turn upside down the shaping of cities, but also the shaping of movements. It's a disruptor to the silos, to the that have each become their own audience in a sense, and you know, use a rarefied language to um, often become more and more distant from the community they're meant to serve. Um, again, the solutions, the skill sets need to be applied and drawn on more heavily. But we see places a way to make the shaping of communities more accessible to everyone. And in many ways, I think you know the the, the focus for public spaces needs to increasingly be on on informality and allowing and respecting informality in the in the shaping of public spaces, in the process, in this, in the use of spaces, um, we've formalized it, and I think that really reflects the formal culture of design. You know that PK mentioned of how we yeah. sort of over-design and make, allow spaces to be rigid. The process has been too rigid as well. Um, you know, in, in in many ways, I think it's you know we you know people are unpacking colonialism right now, and and uh, um, and you know sort of white culture, uh, white supremacist culture. These, these are you know things that really need to be challenged and they're reflected in the culture of our institutions that are shaping the built environment. Um, you know, often subconsciously, uh, you know, often they're embedded, um, but uh, non-white culture is what's actually needed to make public spaces better in many, for many people, for everybody um, in, in many cases. And, you know, certainly in India, the, you know, how, how in, in any city really, how we figure out ways to draw on and support informal Communities, informal life, um, informal workers, uh, even in benefiting from public spaces and contributing to public spaces is how you know cities will succeed and fail. Um, again, it's not just about doing it because it's the right thing to do or because because you know, it's a crisis, but it's it's also you know fun, joy, comfort, um, being relaxed, being informal in a public space is also what's going to go viral. It's what it's when when it's the happiness that that can be created through. Um, feeling like you're shaping your space, that you you belong in a space, uh, and you can open up in ways that allow you to connect to other people, to bridge difference, to to um, to to forge networks, to forge communities, to build capacity, to take on bigger challenges. Um, this the, the culture change that public space and placemaking can bring about at a small scale that can go viral um, when people see these joy when the, when they see the. Uh, um, the change that can uh, can be brought around at a low cost, um, you know, low low scale way, the, the culture change that um, is is huge. So uh, it, it's 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 a few small places within cities that we you know the, the idea of place making X is you focus on the sort of power of ten idea. A great place needs at least ten reasons to be in it. It's the purpose. It's the the excuses to spend time in that space. It's not design can play an important role, but usually after the, the uses the functions have have been created decided on by the community um but we need great destinations and we need to uh within cities as well that each have 10 places each with 10 things to do in it uh we need to show places that are markets that are in low-income communities that are w welcoming and fun uh we need you know high iconic places as well we need great waterfronts like mumbai's waterfront that pk was involved with that become the face of the city and they're continually created and recreated by people's use of those of those spaces um you know, public markets vending, you know, the work of groups like WeGo and, um, you know, it, it, I really do want to say you know, that is sort of the the the, uh, the biggest challenge and opportunity for making cities work uh, you know, and how we're, restaurants now are allowed to use spaces. We need to figure out how also informal um, vending and can can use spaces in ways that contribute to public spaces in the best on the best streets and the best markets. Every use, every user, every customer almost competes to contribute to shared value. Everyone's smiling it's it's contagious the, the the joy is contagious and that's the antidote to the the the, the fear um that uh that can pervade and prevent good good urbanism good good cities to 
from from succeeding. Um, and now, as people can live where they work, as they can invest where they work, they in more, in more where they can live anywhere they choose and invest anywhere they choose more than ever. Um, places that people love, places that people feel welcome in, but feel belonging in, are the ones that are going to succeed most in the future. Um, you know, across income, across culture. Uh, so it's all the more important for cities to to invite people, to give love to them, to contribute to them, to co-create them, um, to determine their success um, going forward. So this is you know, obviously you know we need to keep building these networks and these conversations, and I look forward to to doing this with you. I think, um, uh, Ethan, you summarized how uh, placemaking can, in a way, bring that interdisciplinary, multifaceted discussion uh, to the table for development. And I think PK earlier on mentioned how uh, you know placemaking is really not about design. It's about the process of engaging communities to be the stewards of that place and deliver um, a place that is important to their ideas and needs. And we have a comment here from Danya Raja Gopal, uh, who's speaking about, you know, in India, for example, 70% of our economy is informal. And in cities, it's made up of, you know, uh, street hawkers and vegetable vendors. And, um, you know, how do you create, you know, and often we are creating our, um, you know, streets without involving these vendors. and Obviously, that's that's probably one of the reasons our cities have become so, uh, you know, exclusive uh, and just kind of built for the car. Um, I, you know, I want to again welcome the amazing community that is joining us from all over the world. As I can see, um, please share your questions in the comment box below. We'll try to take uh, some of them for PK and Ethan to answer. Um, but I guess we are quickly running out of time already. This has been a very rich conversation, Lucy. Yeah, very rich. Um, do I have time to ask one more? Well, in case yeah. anybody's got questions. In fact, I, what I'm going to do is to build on uh, uh, Daniel Raja Gopal's uh, comment where they said, um, place-based partnership coalition is the most important thing. It brings in care, funding, ownership, maintenance, and safety. Um, so I think the question I wanted to ask is about um, partnership, but also about governance, because place making is really important, but place governance is equally important to make sure that places carry on um, delivering all of these things. Um, and uh, that they're managed and le led in good ways. So what are the one or two innov innovations that you would like to see in, in place governance in the next uh, in the next period going forward? Yeah, I'd love to take that one. Um, that's in place governance really is my favorite topic. And I, and I think sort of the frontier of, of, of change for, for the placemaking movement. Um, and again, every part of in, in, in every part of the world is is leading on place governance from different perspectives and also limiting from different perspectives. They're coming at it from strengths, um, and often those strengths are blocking leadership from other sectors. So, looking at it globally, we can start to to take innovations from different parts of the world. Um, I work a lot in Australia and New Zealand. They're very progressive from a government perspective. The cities are doing a pretty good job, but it's they're realizing that there's not. They're, they've almost limited or blocked capacity from communities to participate because they're delivering places for them, not with them, and not building their capacity. Um, so they're actually there's a lot because of that. There's a lot of learning on how do you develop place-led models of governance. Um, business improvement districts, main streets haven't been as strong there because that hasn't been the crisis for them. Sure. Um, but uh, I actually think you know some of the fastest-growing parts of the world have a lot to learn from places like Australia. Um, not to just copy top-down models of governance, but real, but you know, but support, foster, learn from the more informal models of governance that are are succeeding in various ways mm -hmm. to manage the public realm, uh, you know, to 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 uh, to create sort of dialogue process in informal ways. You know, we don't sometimes we go too far to formal governance and destroy throughout the sort of 
the informal aspects of it. Um, but that said, I think at, in all around the world, there's a trajectory towards sort of place governance at the district, community, neighborhood scale that's needed. Uh, mm -hmm. And we really need to reinvent um, government democracy from that scale up. Uh, it's focusing on shared public spaces and places that enable this governance to emerge in a way that's that's democratic, um, grounded in action, practical, um, and uh, uh, and you know can can create the sort of the visible changes that are that are needed for democracy to keep keep going. Um, but uh, you know we need to look at how it's not just about the the places; it's about local ec economies and governance. It's it's about local financing models the value capture models how do how do we perpetuate uh mm -hmm. show that that investments in shared value um can be sustained uh you know support local business and, and, and property value to an extent but uh, at a much higher ratio support shared value and access for all um support opportunities for for livelihoods for jobs um for sort of um we, we talk about uh in a healthy city has a full scale from informal to spectrum from informal to formal where there's opportunities for entering the job force and and moving up so you know we need street vendors need to see how they can formalize slightly perhaps and uh, uh and, and have, have greater opportunities to grow their their business and their economic mm. their economic fortunes um so governance needs to be looked at you know holistically you know from a from a participatory perspective from a financial perspective and from a development design perspective how you know how do we create whole new you know new models of place-led development and design Mm. that are grounded in and support these governance structures mm. as well. Mm. Brilliant. PK, yeah, may I just add, may I just add on something to this discussion? Yeah. Yeah, to me, one of the biggest uh, dangers to democratization of governance is privatization. Uh, the increased trust towards privatization of public assets, uh, including public spaces. Um, increasingly, governments world over abdicating their responsibility of beholding uh, public interest and entrusting it to private sector. And that's a huge contradiction to the very idea of collective government or democratization of governments or engagement of the local population in governments or public spaces. Um, so I keep saying, therefore, this whole movement of public spaces uh, uh, reclaiming public spaces is really about uh, a political struggle against privatization, against mm. colonization of public assets, mm. uh, and so forth. And therefore, we need to uh, keep aligning ourselves with larger democratic rights struggles, uh, including, for example, placemaking movements, uh, being able to relate to and associate with Black Lives Matter. Very significant. It's mm. Black Lives Matter is an issue in every place of the world. Uh, and, and those shades of discrimination and exclusion have to be fought. And privatization is one enormous political weapon mm -hmm. uh, our uh, neoliberalized governments uh, through privatization are kind of uh, you know, uh, uh, trusting upon us. Uh, so to me, really, it's in, uh, we have to be extremely careful when we are talking about governance of public spaces, for we are very, very vulnerable, very subtly vulnerable uh, mm. to having over public spaces by our governments and our municipal corporations in the name of better maintenance, mm -hmm. in the name of beautification to these private agencies. Mm. And so our struggle is against colonization. Mm -hmm. against discrimination. Mm -hmm. Yeah, da and Dania makes um, two very sharp uh, suggestions in addition, which um, I will flag up because I think we're almost out of time now, um, which uh, we will just leave there as um, very good suggestions. To have social justice evaluation criteria when planning are, and that's India, but that's also all over the world as well, smart cities, can we also not make a case for public health and relate it to the funding of public space? Now, that is obviously a huge question of social equality as the pandemic has revealed so many inequalities. And uh, 
you, the, you know, seeing public space quality through the lens of public health is Absolutely. now more fundamental than ever before. So um, um, I'm sorry we didn't have more time for audience questions, but um, we've engaged, uh, I think, with, with a few points that have been made very well today. So um, over to you, Prathama, a little summing up. <laughs> Yeah, I think I love the. <laughs> we need more time to discuss this, but yeah, I, I think. I said I love the talk too much. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> anyway. No, I think this is an important topic, and it's um, you know it was so nice to hear both of your you know perspective. Thank you so much for your leadership and vision in this very important uh, matter. We completely take your points of the need for more uh, intersectionality um, mm. as we you know think about these issues you know bring race gender um, you know economic inequality to the you know forefront as mm. we uh, frame our agenda for the future and i pk i completely uh, get your point as we go through this you know point of great disruption which a lot of people are calling the great reset um, you know, the world, the, obviously the world, the the normal before COVID did not work, uh, even from an economic perspective. So hopefully the other end of the tun tunnel post this pandemic, uh, hopefully will be capitalism with a heart. And uh, hopefully with, hopefully we can see governments uh, using the energy of the private sector to deliver more social capital. Uh, and uh, you know it's it's so it's so uh, nice to have both of you lay out those very important agenda for all of us thank you so much for joining us this evening i also want to say thanks to all the amazing community that joins us every tuesday um please uh, you know join us next week as well we are going to be discussing another important topic which is the future of development um, and uh, it'll we are going to host this every Tuesday at 4:30 p.m. Uh, uh, BST, 5:30 p.m. CEST, 9 p.m. IST, and 11:30 a.m. EST. So I hope we can convene this global uh, meeting of the minds and actually develop a detailed manifesto for the future of cities because I guess it's crucial to uh, future of us. <laughs> Um, as human civilization. So thank you again. Have a great day, all of you. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thanks. It's tremendous. Thank you.